Thank you to all my team and Matt Fidesz. Yes! The man. It took a while, about three or four weeks later, he left an answer phone message on my, my main martial arts school basketball. My little brother called me up saying, you wouldn't effing believe who's left the message here. <laughs> Michael Jackson, he couldn't believe it. He's kept a plane about 50 times over and over again. And I, and I drove down to this school and it was Michael. And yeah, went out to New York, spent some time with him. He's recording his album, Invincible. And um, yeah, we became best buddies. And then about a year or so later, because I was, I had big muscles back then. I was a martial arts guy. And, I was his mate, I felt he was vulnerable. Whenever we'd go out in public, he would get mobbed by paparazzi and the public. I, I just you just put my arm around and protect him and I became his, his bodyguard. In the end, I said to Michael, you spend all his crazy money out. He lost his long-term bodyguards. I'll, I'll take over your security operation. I want nothing from you. I want no money, nothing. I don't want a transactional relationship. I've made my money. And um, because of that, it worked. You did it all for free? Did it all for free. Matt, welcome to the show. You're welcome. Thank Glad you for, to be on. Thank you for coming here today, pal. Yeah. Um, so, Matt, you've you've been a, a black belt in karate. You're an entrepreneur of the year in 2022. Um, a property investor, a good friend to Michael Jackson and bodyguard. Um, but before we get into that, let's start from the beginning. Where did it all start for you? Yeah, it started, it started for me with with the martial arts. So I was getting bullied at school, like a lot of people. But there's a pain point that triggers you to go on to be successful. And for me, it was this bully at school who was just constantly on my case. And I didn't enjoy school. It wasn't for me. I um, come from a very academic family where my mum's one of 14 children or went to university. And that's the scene for the th thing to do for your kids, you know. And my my dad's side was get a trade, become an electrician, plumber, engineer, and so on. So for me, I found something that I was good at. So I was always good at. The first martial art I did was Taekwondo. And I'm tall, I've got long legs, and I could do all the kicks that was involved in Taekwondo. And a child next to me in school said, listen, this bully's going to beat you up one day real bad. Come and learn how to defend yourself. And I actually went to something that I, that I was good at. I was getting praise from the instructor, or from the teacher, rather than being told that I'm making mistakes or I'm not good at this or I won't amount to anything. And I just knew, strangely enough, just from day one really, that this is all I ever wanted to do. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew this is what I wanted to do for a career. And uh, yeah, you, you hear these stories where these pain points motivate you. I really wanted to prove the bully wrong. And I show, wanted to show my parents wrong, my grandparents wrong, that I could be successful in in, in something a bit different. You know, teaching martial arts for a living, which back then was not a thing. Now everyone's tried to do it, you know, but it's, it wasn't a thing. And yeah, that led on to me having the biggest chain of martial arts schools in the world, which is over 1,800 sites now this time. So, Because so, so, I read somewhere that you was a millionaire by 20. Yeah, I was a millionaire by 19. 19. Yeah, we're well, making a million, million a year. And um, by the time I was 22, I was properly done. I was like financially free. I bought property by that time I was... I had passive income coming in. If I want, I did try and retire. I was very, I thought it'd be cool, 22 to try and retire. I was on antidepressants within three months. You know, cause I, Were you? Yeah, I was bored out my brain. Some of my friends had to still go to work and mm. there were only so much times you can go to the gym, you know. And you, you must have lost that sense of purpose though, right? You I lost mean, your identity, yeah. 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 So, so how, did you, how did you become so wealthy at such a young age? Yeah, so in my, I, I believe a lot on the law of attraction and... In my mathematics class, I just found the whole school, I still do now, I talk very openly about it, very outdated. That's kind of one of my successes, because I teach everything through my martial arts schools, the MF martial arts schools, that the school system don't teach. So we, we plugged in a life skill education system where we teach them good manners, you know, water safety, fire safety, goal setting, respect, discipline, you know, that they can achieve anything they want. They've got to dream it, believe it, achieve it. And I wrote homework for them. And at the end of every lesson, they sit down for 15 minutes with their instructor and they study a subject. And it's all very educational. The martial arts is just a hook. I went on to do it with dance schools and Pilates schools in the end as well. And the same, same, same business model, same education system, we just changed the subject. So I, I knew that I could, I was, I was on to something. And in the mathematics class, they were trying to teach me a GCSE question. If you're watching this from abroad, it's uh, high school 
like an exam when you leave school about 16, 17. And one of the questions was how many different ways can you put a 50p coin, well, 50p into a phone box? Is it going to be two 20ps and a 10 or five 10ps? And I just thought this is utterly ridiculous. I don't know what just bored out my brain and looking around the classroom. Well, how on earth is this going to help me do anything? I just want to teach martial arts. And I was about 13 at the time. And we had these exercise books back then. For each, you had one for, for each subject for a secondary school. And I flicked it to the back and I wrote a list of goals. We still got it to this day. And some of the things were like, uh, if you're a martial artist or bodybuilder, you might understand it, but you won't understand it otherwise. Like I wanted to be able to do the splits like John claude Van Damme on the chairs, you know. <laughs> After six pack and the pecs, the muscles. And other things too where... I wanted to be the, the, the most well-known martial arts instructor in the world. And I wanted to be the millionaire by the time I was 20. I wanted to own a Ferrari because my next brother down, Nathan, is an incredible artist. And he could draw cars. He's amazing. So when I when I was growing up, I could always see him drawing like Ferrari 355s, Testarossas and F40s. He's incredible. And he, he, stud, he studied that. So I wanted that's like a symbolic thing for me of, trying to prove people wrong I think almost like a, vis a visualization yeah yeah so every time I went to my maths class I just used to open up turn to that page and then think about it and and, and train every day and and weight training from a very early age um, I was going to the gym like 11 12 every single day I mean my parents thought it was utterly weird my grandparents took me for a big lecture my grandfather he said uh you can make any money, make throwing your legs around in the air, Matthew. You know, this isn't going to work out. And he's become an electrician or a plumber. This is ridiculous. And that just made me want to do it more. Mm. Yeah, my my mum my had a bit of faith in me. Uh, she did. She like said, uh, there's no such word as can, and you can do whatever you want. But openly, she wouldn't admit that. But to me, privately, she would. She kind of thought, maybe, you know, something could come of this. Because I left school with no qualifications whatsoever, just my black belt. And then I went on to get a personal trainer exam, which which um, called Baller at college, and then just went for it, started my own business. Do you know what? It's, it's, it's quite incredible to see that, that someone so young actually already knew what they wanted to do. Because for me, I didn't have a clue until yeah. I actually became the plumber in the end because I, I failed at school. I didn't quite... Uh, I wasn't quite academically clever, if I'm honest with you. And I don't think I found out what my niche was until yeah. kind of later on. Um, but the, the fact that you had that so earlier on gave lucky. you that focus and that, that drive. So, but, so, so so what kind of happened for you? So you you went on antidepressants at 22, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. They stuck me on antidepressants and sleeping tablets at 22. And at, at, at that stage, I, I sold it for a great sum of money. So I had this big location in a town called Barnstable. And it's 700 members and somebody wanted to buy it off me. I think they paid 1.2 million, something like that. I sold it and I ended up taking it back a year later because they just didn't run, run it right and ruined it and took it back and still managed to keep the money, just the way it, way it works. And um, yeah, I mean, but before that point, I was already already on to something. So we had, I had five locations in North Devon, which is quite a secluded area. You've got Barnstable, Biddeford, Ilfacombe, Torrington, South Moulton, Bronson. Then they were all done. I had a Matt Finesse Martial Arts School in every single one. And the hub of it was in Barnstable where they had 700 members there. And all the others had about 150, 200 members. I was doing about 1.5 million a year in profit. And I, I was at a stage where I was able to train up a team to take the classes for me so I didn't have to take the classes too. So I didn't have a great lot to, a deal to do. And my best friend became Yuri Geller. And Yuri was world famous and I looked up to him. And he taught me from the age of 18, you know, you need to, you earn all this money. Don't keep buying Ferraris, so invest in property. And and that was my thing. I hated him for it. You know, I was like, God dear me. He'd ring me and say, yeah, how many more properties you bought? They're, they're never going to build any more land. It's so important. That's where the real money's made. And I was buying on average about five a month. Five properties? Yeah, from the age of 18 and, and, and kept that going. And uh the time I was 22, I, I was done. I mean, I, I didn't have to work. I had... I had you know, I had the business bringing in one and a half million a year. I had the properties which were bringing in, there were HMOs. Um, they're bringing about five, six thousand a month on profit. So I, I really didn't have to work again forever. And I realized how easy it is to construct a plan to build an income and invest it so you don't have to work anymore. But then I, all my friends had to go and work in factories, do night shifts and day shifts, jobs they hate, 
had an effect on their relationships and so on. And I had this dream life where I'd, you teach, well, I'm doing my passion from my profession. My career is my passion. That thing I love, martial arts, became my my career. Yeah, my profession. And it, it became big time. So I can see how problematic it can be once you've reached a, a certain level of success or, or financial freedom, how did you did you feel like you lost a bit of fire in your belly at one point? Nah, well, not in, not in my early 20s. I was just uh, obsessed. And I think it's just the way I'm wired up. Because mm. even though I made the money, I still wasn't satisfied. And I had the Ferrari and I, I did become extremely well known. I was on the front cover of the martial arts magazines all over the world and getting featured in national and international media. Everyone wanted to be around me and study what I did. How did I build this incredible business? No one had done this before, in the UK anyway. But um, no, it, I just wanted more and more. And, and people around me just couldn't understand it. Like, cause I, literally, I, 20 years old, I moved into a mansion, like a credible place in, in North Devon. Got a Ferrari on the drive and a Mercedes. And uh, I got married very young. And yeah, people around, what's wrong with you? Why are you still working all the hours? I mean, I used to work till like two in the morning and sleep in and go to the gym and then work just flat out, just completely flat out. And I still do now, but I've got a bit more of a balance of it now. I've got six kids and- Six? Uh, yeah. Wow. But I, I think my, my tenacity and my ambition for working so hard, that kind of ruined my first marriage. Cause I was married for 10 years the first time around, but- How, how did it, how did it, in what way? Well. To be fair to her, she didn't sign up to, well, I was, how old was I got married? Like 20 or something. And she's older than me. She's like 27. I, she didn't sign up for somebody who wanted to go, ended up hanging around with the most famous people in the world and have helicopters flying over and paparazzi chasing you down and tabloid newspaper articles and people talking about you at school and making gossip up. Because back then there was no internet as such. There was mainstream tabloid media. So... It, it would be constant. And because of my success, so young, I thought it was normal, but um, obviously everyone in, in a town like that, especially in the back of beyond in North Devon, a guy who's driving around in the, his 20s in a brand new Ferrari 355 in perfect shape, making all this money, and his best friends are the most famous men in the world, and um, has a mansion, it's talk of the town, it's just unheard of. And I'm not from that area. I was born in Swindon originally. I moved down there to open the business. I didn't want to open up on my martial arts instructor's doorstep. It's not seen as a thing to do, so I moved down there to do it. So yeah, I mean, I started off working as a lifeguard in North Devon Leisure for £2.75 an hour in a bedsit. And I had three bedsits, I got evicted out of each one, got into a rented house, and I figured this business thing out. But yeah, to be fair to her, she signed up to... Uh, I think a marriage that she kind of thought, why would you want to do any more than what you've got? We've got everything we need. Don't need any more money. Stay in, in the evenings, watch TV, TV shows and relax. But that's not who I am. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I just, uh, just the way I'm wired. So it's just, it, I, I don't believe there is such a thing as work-life balance at all. But it was, it, it was definitely my ambition and my, lack of respect to what she had to deal with with my three, I've got three daughters with a massive load of Savannah, what she had to deal with them. So I'd come home from work, grab one of the kids, have a nap, cuddle the kids, play with them for a bit, and then I'll go to the gym at 9.30 till 10.30 at night, and then come back and she, and my ex wife was exhausted, and then stay working to two, three in the morning. Yeah, so it's what it is. I would change, yeah. I think it's all worked out fine in the end, so. I mean, I mean, there is an age thing with that as well. Like, I think that hunger of, yeah, like, of wanting to to push on all the time. I think yeah, there's always sacrifices to be made in in life. And yeah, if you're kind of content with where you're going, you've always got to let go of certain things, and it's not nice to because you you kind of want your cake and eat it. That's the the problem in life. Yeah, you can't quite have it have it all. No, you can, and and and, and, and do you know what? It is an age thing. Because now I, I'm 44 now, and I get it now, looking back. But when you're in your early 20s, you think you're invincible. Mm. And you, you, there is a slight amount. Of, you can't not be cocky when you're earning that kind of money at such a young age and having those connections and contacts. And everyone's looking up to you and how the heck did you do that? I wanted to know you. And you, it's very hard. Like now I mentor a lot of entrepreneurs and how to be successful and do well. And I say to them, it's just so hard for you to understand. But... 
yeah, put, put your success first, but you, what needs to come first is your health, your family, mm. and then the success will be a byproduct from the business that you set up. If you go, if you go out focusing on success, then something's going to give at some point. To, to, to be fair, I totally agree with that because, you know, I've had my own version of what success looks like and I try to balance my life more now than I ever did because I was working all the time when I was young. Yeah. Do you think you have to reach a certain stage to get there for you to then adopt a different mindset? Well, you got to go through some pain. You, you can teach this stuff. I mean, I mean, I hope that when I am on stage and or on podcasts, people will listen. And cause it's called the school of hard knocks, isn't it? But you have to go through some pain. And, and how I had a business partner in Germany and we had MF martial arts schools all over Germany. And he, I was driving him back to the airport to Birmingham Airport. I remember the conversation in the car. I was about 10 years into my career. I'd done really well. I made like 30 million. And he said, um, you can't keep touching things and it could turn into gold. This can't go on forever. You know, it's, something will go wrong. And I was like, nah, it's never going to happen. It's, you know, I was driving a brand new Ferrari 360 then. And um, yeah, he stayed at our incredible home. And I said, nah, I just completely dismissed it. And I think it's, it's going to be, it must be around like 2000 and seven something like that and he was adamant something will go wrong mate you, you, you can't keep going on like this you know it's just been magical literally and then in, in 2009 i had a series of things happen i had uh my mum called me and said i've got six months to live she had breast cancer and she was like my rock and then i had my obviously we'll get onto that but michael jackson was one of my best friends he passed away suddenly out of the blue in that same year. And then a close family member tried to copy what I did, which is kind of daft. But then looking back, it, the person was only in their, their very, very young time. had people in their ear all the time trying to think, you can do this, you can do it yourself. You made Matt Rich and, you know, and it didn't work out for them, but they tried to copy exactly what, what, I, what I did, as in building up martial arts school through my model. But you can't copy what I've done. I mean, it's like the social proof and been around and the lessons I've had from incredible mentors and things. Yeah, and, and then the, the final thing, really, after all that, is Marcy, I, my ex wife well, I call her my rehearsal wife, she, uh, we got on very well, she just, you know, we couldn't take any more of this. She didn't sign up for this. I mean, it's this crazy life of betrayal. Because that's one thing when you're an entrepreneur, you get screwed over, you get talked about, you get gossiped, you get trolled and hated on, and your life's not normal. You have to react at late at night. She didn't sign up for any of that. So she filed for divorce. We split up, and yeah, it all happened in one year, literally. So that was that was my pain point, and the real changing point for me, where I I, I woke up, is that Mum passed away. They said she had six months to live in two thousand and nine, but she passed away on May the twenty fifth, two thousand and twelve. So she did really well fighting it. But when you put your mum in the grave, and I was thirty two, and she was fifty six, you, you realise there's thirty million I'm worth, and my contact book couldn't do nothing. I hired the best professors. I, I used my celebrity superstar friends. I did everything I could. And I came away from that, like, this bit, bit bewildered, like, what on earth is this all about? This is strange. And plus, I was, I was at the funeral with my three young daughters. They must have been, like, seven, five, and four then. And watching their nanny go in the grave and looking at them, thinking, dear me, you know, this, this is, yeah, this money thing I got, don't mean nothing because I couldn't even save my own mum. So that's the school of hard knocks. You have to go through a pain point to wake up and think, okay, this is not right. The way I've been acting since my since I was 18, maybe I've been a bit cocky, I've done some stupid things and um, not realizing it because it's all I've ever known. I've never had a freaking normal job. It's just straight into wealth and money and success. And and it just, uh, yeah, spiral. But it's, it's an interesting one. I do, when, I, when I'm on stage and I talk about this, I see people sit forward because they can relate. Oh, he's been on antidepressants. He's... He's been on sleeping tablets. He's, he's had some traumas in his life. He's had a divorce, you know. He's had a, a loved one who's passed away, really. And they relate to you and they sit forward. And rather than these entrepreneur mental gurus are just talking like, yeah, it's all great. You've got Lamborghinis. It's all going to be wonderful. Yeah. You look behind the scenes because a lot goes wrong to get there. You have to go through a lot of navigating pain and to be able to, to get there. The human body moves away from pain to go to pleasure. But if you want to be successful as an entrepreneur, you need to go towards pleasure. You need to train in the gym, lift the heavy weights, do the things you don't want to do, you know, and work the hours, network with the right people. You need to move towards pain. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. So looking at all of these years of your success, 
looking back at it, was it all worth it or would you have done f- things differently? Um, I get to, to do some tremendous things now that I wouldn't be able to do if it weren't for the fact of my success. So I, like last night, I was with, you mentioned earlier on, I was with Simon Cowell all evening and we were raising, I don't know how much we've raised, but we raised lots of money for children's hospices uh, together for short lives, his charity. And obviously I got to know him and his family through my journey and and success and and other things too like on sunday i got a call out of the blue the weekend there was this young boy and his mum was dying in um in devon and his, his dream the mum wanted to see him he had this um this love of supercars so the hospice calls at any chance at all i know it's short notice that you can bring a few supercars up and take him out because his mum's going to pass away in a few days time and she wants to witness it, if you can make it happen. And, and I was able to drop everything, so I don't have to be anywhere at any certain time. And I took a Lamborghini and a Ferrari and uh, took him out. And she came out in a wheelchair with her oxygen on. And that is why you come back and you think, wow, it's all worth it, you know. Mm-hmm. But the money side, right, This once you get past, this is the truth. The, the, the key to success, really, you need to earn six figures profit. A lot of these mentors or online gurus out there talk about turnover. Like turnover is vanity, profit is sanity. It's all a load of nonsense and it really annoys me. And a lot of these people are fake it till you make it, guys. Who've actually, if you look behind uh, what they're doing, they've never actually done it before. They've become wealthy by selling courses, become wealthy. It's very strange because I've had to go through the hard way. It's, if it works for them and they change lives, then it's all great. But it's very strange the way the online world has gone since, since the, you know, I won't say it because you might get banned, since the way you had to stay at home for a period of time. Um, so so for me, I think it's it's about six-figure profit and then investing into an asset class that you understand. So I only invest in asset classes that I... So I don't invest in gold. I've got friends who are very good at gold. Mm. Don't invest in watches. I don't invest in stuff. So supercars and real estate property is... I know that back to front. I've been doing that all my life, all my adult life. And I built up the biggest privately owned property portfolio in the southwest of the UK. So six-figure income for me... It's very simple to teach people how to do and 10 grand a month because after your taxes took off in the UK, you're left with about 5,000. You can earn a decent income on that. And then buy property the right way because the system for that too and then develop a passive income. So money works for you and you don't have to work for money. So that's what I'm about now, trying to educate people. But was it all worth it? Maybe if I if I um, went back, apart from the amazing things I get to do, like the things I described and helping people out and I privately because I lost my mum to breast cancer, rather than, I support Simon Cowell's charity because I know his family. One of the, Emma Cowell I've known of for over like 25 years. And I know there's nobody milking the charity. There's no multi-millionaire who's on the payroll or nothing. You know, Simon and his, and the team there for that charity, that was that last night, it goes in the right places. It's done, but a lot of charities and very rich people above it. So I, I like helping private causes out. So I pay for people's operations and, especially breast cancer, uh, people on long waiting lists and stuff, or other countries, then I'll just get it done and pay for it for them. So yeah, stuff like that is what makes it worth it. But honestly, material things, anything past 10 million, there's nothing else you need. You can pretty much have the house you want, the cars you want, other than something stupid like a private jet or something like that, you, even then you just hire it. The, the, nothing changes. The holidays, you can have any holiday you want. And then... The stress levels, because being successful is about how much stress you can tolerate. The stress levels from that point onwards to where I went is another level. So if I could go back, I wouldn't change it. Of course I wouldn't. But if, if people listen out there, you've got to think hard. So I have sacrificed, although I'm 44, I've, I've been working full on, like literally. I haven't had a huge amount of holidays and don't maybe enjoy my wealth like I should do. That Maybe 10 million is, is where you need to be. And I believe that, like million pound 25 years ago was a lot of money, it's not anymore. Mm-hmm. 10 million is a new million now, now. If you want to be able to retire and, and have passive income of 5% a year coming in from property, that's 500,000 a year, you're good. You're good and you're done. And you can focus on staying healthy and doing things you love and you've been with your family. Because this, uh, you know, as you, as you were saying that, what I was thinking about was this must be more to you than just money now at this stage. Yeah. You, you've got I financial freedom. Less. Yeah. So, you know, what's your what's your drivers? What keeps you going? What's your passions? Yeah, it's 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 not money because money's not like a it's not a thing. People say, oh, you, do you know when you grow up you I don't know if you're you're religious, but I've 
grew up in a very religious school and it was all money is the root of all evil. I mean, it's in the Bible, right? Mm. Yeah, and I used to hear stupid saying that money won't grow on trees. Money's not important. Money doesn't make you happy. And Well, I, that's not true. I mean, I was poor in a bed set. I watched my parents struggle through the 1989 recession. They couldn't pay the mortgage, almost lost the house. My dad had to stay at home and become a house but my mum had to go out and be the breadwinner and he got depressed and yeah, it's not true. Money is not a thing, it's, it's a tool. It's like a hammer, you can use a hammer to put a nail in or you can smash someone's face in it. So if you use money the right way, then it will make you happy and you can use it to make other people happy. You know, who wants to drive a rubbish car? You know, who wants to go on a cheap rubbish holiday with cockroaches and stuff and no air con? Who wants rubbish healthcare? If your child's ill and you can't get an appointment at the moment in the NHS, which you hear about every single day, then you've got the power to be able to get them the next day privately. So money is not a thing. It's how you use money. It can either make you happier, happier or it can destroy you, but it's not a tool. It's, it's something, so it's not a thing. It's a tool that you can use for good. It just makes you a bigger, worse person or better person of who you are already. So so it's extremely important, but it's, it's not the be all and end all. For me, it's not money that drives me now, because since 22, I haven't had to worry about them. I don't, don't have to look at receipts. I know it's been a, I can't really remember now, honestly, anything other than the pain of getting evicted from those bed sits and maybe having to look at, I oh, sound staff, right? Like buying a pasty and a little cake or something from some place in Broughton, whether I could add up, it's in the early, early days, like 96. Um, I can't remember not being able to afford anything I want. I can afford anything I want. And, and that's been incredible feeling. And I want, that's my passion. I want everyone to be able to do that because I just believe that everyone should have financial freedom and have money freedom. And um, yeah, so so for me now, it's about points. So if you're a sprint runner, you've got a time clock. You're bodybuilder, you've got a mirror. So for me, if I'm offering a credible service or product, my byproducts will be money. I see the money as points. And I can put that to good use and offer more careers and what I do, teach people how to make money, teach people how to be more healthier, get stress out of their life. Most divorces are caused by money. Most bad relationships with kids are called money. Most antidepressants and where well, people are on antidepressants, sleeping tablets or drugs is caused by trying to escapism from the lack of money. So so for, for me, it's not about the money, but I see it as uh, not material things. I've got all that. It's a point scoring system. So yeah, I want to be a billionaire because I can help change more lives and help people become more millionaires, pay for more operations, do great things, spend more time with entrepreneurs, startups. You know, I don't believe the school system works. It's completely broken. And I want them to come on to a path where this is how you do it. This is how you make six figures, whether it's offline or online. So I built my business in the offline world. And learn from me. I've got no qualifications. I, I, I'm a living example that you can do it. School and, of life. Yeah. And all this nonsense about... Um, then There is some extreme cases out there. But it's interesting enough, when I started off my martial arts school in 1997, there was no ADHD. There was no autisms. There was just... You just had kids with a lot of energy or a little bit naughty now it's like 50 60 different labels so i got we got kids coming in labeled with this this and this and this and all they really want is an activity to get them off that damn ipad or playstation off the screen time you know i mean i don't know how old you are but i when we we're little we used to go and play in the trees and it was safe and go home when the the light street lamps came on and and it was fine you can't do that nowadays it's the world's too dangerous obviously but it's it's uh yeah, money is important, absolutely. I mean, if you had a choice to having it and not having it, and it, it does make you happy. I mean, people who say it doesn't, the ones that don't have it. Mm. Actually, they never experienced it. How could they even judge you? They never had millions of pounds. They've got no idea. What, what, what do you think um, stops people from wanting to be successful? Well, they, over, they overcomplicate it. I mean, people try and come up with new ideas all the time. Like... Um, Amount of time I get pitched, I come off stages and I get pitched. I've got this idea for this, an idea for this. Literally, right, all, honest truth, everything in the world has pretty much been done. Unless you want to be an Elon Musk and go to Mars and you know, be the next pioneer in electric cars or whatever the next thing is going to be, then you don't need a new idea. You just need to look at what you love doing, like you love doing podcasts and making shows and telling inspirational stories. Go out there, find someone, study them, and make it better. And this kind of Information has been around now for a long time. Anthony, Tony Robbins, uh, um, one of the first books I read was Unleash the Power Within. 
And he talks about modeling, how you model someone. Find someone who's doing who you want to do, health-wise, business-wise, model it, and then take it into your own life and make yourself successful. And uh, and that's that's the, that's it. People overcomplicate. They get overwhelmed, or they think everything's going to be get rich. There's no get. I know, I know you get your get rich thing every now and then, like a cryptocurrency will go up, and then some people are multi-millionaires, or I don't know, with some luck. But you want a get rich slow program. You what? don't. Because the get rich quick things are just long nonsense. I mean, I I can't even tell you ones now that I would tell you to go and do that. To get wealthy over ten years is very easy. I can take you and say, okay, this is where you want to be, George, over the next ten years, and you want to make this much money. We can do a series of steps to get you there through investment and through earning six figures, seven figures a year's profit. Profit. That's easy. People underestimate what they can do in a decade because they think, oh, 10 years, that's a long time. And they overestimate what you can do in a year. Years go like by in a flash. Mm -hmm. And they get stressed. So they, they do all their goals in a year and years. Rest of the year. They've got to start this business. And by Christmas, I want to be earning this. It's not going to happen. It, it, you've got to do it over a stage or period. So for, for me now, my wealth is compounding. And people should study compound on how that works. So all the properties I bought when I was 18, they, I bought them for like 30 grand. They're worth... 350 400 thousand and i've done nothing it's incredible the rent was then 300 pound now it's 1200 pound mm. you, you just gotta sit and hold with it you gotta be patient you gotta just be consistency is the key to success it's like it's like if you want to get big muscles you're not going to go to the gym so you want to get big big arms do some bicep curls tricep presses and then come away and expect them to be ready it's an ongoing process, process. Yeah, yeah taking small steps going over a period of time and in five years time with the right diet and advice and mentoring you're going to get there and, and making money is the same thing people expect get rich quick and, and there's a lot of misinformation out there because a lot of people that with instagram especially with the fake bodies and the fake jet they've hired for the afternoon and mm -hmm. hired the lamborghini and ferrari and yeah and they believe into it and it's not true well you're you're, you're battling that kind of lifestyle as well at the yeah. same time so <clears throat> what i found in my entrepreneur journey is I had to make a lot of sacrifices, work all the time and not really enjoy it. So yeah. and that's how I compounded the years of it all turning into a level of success. But you kind of see all of these like lavish lifestyles and you're like, you get drawn to that very, I, I knew a lot of um, younger footballers and they'd be in like the under 21s for Arsenal because they used to live with my family. And you'd see the ones that were passionate about the sport yeah. Done well, and then the others that were passionate about the materialistic, and that's what sent them off the the wrong. And then you're and then you're in this world of like living hand to mouth because you you all your costs are so high, and you're just about making ends meet. Yeah. So I, I think the entrepreneur journey isn't as <laughs> as a, as entertaining or amazing, but it does create good opportunity for you later in life. Um, I yeah. just I, I think a lot of the time we're looking for that instant gratification that instant reward system and things take a, a long time like well, you, you, the current age you're looking for that endorphin dopamine hit so when they're scrolling they're looking you know for that instant hit or that instant emotional release they, they're, they're looking for that and then they see someone that they want that lifestyle and they think that's going to give them that feeling of being incredible mm. like my wife she's, she's amazing and we, we've been married like 12 years now I've got three children with her and um the thing I battle with, which may well, you'll find deeply bizarre, or you might understand it, is we we got this incredible house, which I'm very grateful for. But this is all I've known, literally, you know, other than my childhood, being grown up with my my, my three brothers. Like, this is all I've known. So me having my own cinema in my house and this incredible house, where if you want to communicate with people, you need to ring them up. I mean, it's massive, right? And yeah, and, and, and the incredible views and you've got the Lamborghini and the Ferraris and everything you can imagine. And um, it's the most insane place. And I'll, I'll stare out the window some days and think, I want to be successful. You know? And she's like, are you kidding me? Like, so you gotta, because I hang around with people who have a higher net worth than me, I want to be where they are. But then, yeah, you forget. You forget the bed sit. And uh, I did this TV show called Rich House, Poor House. I did two episodes of that. And I, that was a wake-up call for me and my children because uh, we had to stay in a council house on a budget in a terraced house where you could hear people through the walls. And, yeah, I hadn't had that since I was a kid. And my kids never experienced that. Like, Daddy, what's, what's, that? what's that talking? What's that music through the door? They were freaked out. 
and, you, and then you realize that, yeah, my life's not normal at all. But you you got to try and stay grounded. You can see why these like superstars or mega rich people go wrong or they go to drugs mm. because nothing changes. I mean, it's you just become used to your surroundings once again. Well, you, you, you kind of create your own reality in life as well. Um, you know, some people are, are born in disadvantaged situations, so there is that as well. But mm. you know, it's quite interesting when you um, you know when you're in that kind of place of th this is what my life is. It, you, is there ever a point where you're content or is it always about the next mountain to climb? Is that what really gives you purpose as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, give it, climbing another mountain, growing. Is there, because sometimes I feel, because I'm like that as well, and sometimes I feel actually bad for thinking like that. Yeah. Because I think the issue that I've got is, is that I don't sometimes look from where I came from, which is the beginning. I look from more from the middle point to the end point. Yeah. And I think you lose gratitude that way. And it's, and it's only so many things you can do too. There's only sometimes you can take your Lambo out or your Ferrari out, and that becomes a novelty after a while. That becomes a norm. Only so many times you can take a holiday, and um, yeah, it's 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 like you said earlier on. Success is a, a journey, not a destination. Mm. So I got to the destination, and I've been to many of the destinations, and. It, it, nothing changes you just want to go to the next one the next one so so when i wake up every day what am i supposed to do what on earth am i supposed to do in the world i there's only one thing i can do which i'm good at which is go out there and change lives and make money as a byproduct mm. that's it what else can i do i can't batter my body in the gym three times a day i ain't going to change anything i'll probably get in worse shape or get unhealthy i can't there's only so much i can you know hang around and walk around or get my steps in and so for me, there's nothing left to do other than make more money. I mean, that is it, really, and change lives on the back of it and have these experiences that you can't buy that happen by chance. So, yeah, it's just not so much I'm wired up differently. I'm privileged to be where I am. I'm grateful where I am. But then again, I don't know any different. So uh, mm. there's always a fear in the back of your head that you're going to lose it one day too, though. And I've got a billionaire friend of mine, Alfie Best, and uh, I speak to him a lot. And he... He's still he's worth 1.4 billion at this current time, and he was a gypsy. He was born on the side of a caravan. They call him a gypsy billionaire. And he's he gets up five in the morning, works until he falls asleep with his phone in the hand at midnight. What drives him is the fear of losing it and getting back to where he was again. That's what drives him. So yeah, for, for me, do you know what's about now? I've got six children, very close to all my six kids. I've got three with my rehearsal wife, three with with Monique. And we, they're very good. We don't have this half brother, half sister stuff. I've got three daughters. I've got with um, Marcia and a daughter and two sons with Minnie. And uh, they, they're very close. We speak often, meet up when we can. The older three have turned out to be very grounded. My ex wife is incredible at doing that. Uh, and so is my, my wife now. They, they, we, they shop at, you know, cheap store, clothing stores. They're not lavish and what have you. And, um, that's what really matters because if you've got the big mansion, the cars, you've got nothing underneath it. So as long as I've got my children and they're healthy and everything's okay, I don't care about the money thing. And that's going from someone who's built nothing to make in, what do they value me at, 2020, 120 million. Um, and, and what really matters is what's under the roof, not what kind of roof you have. That's pretty much all that matters. Food, water, heat, and being happy with your children, all the rest of it is great because you can help people out, you can help charities out, um, you can do special causes, you can change lives. But other than that, it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, not like people think it is. So you you said you've done this rich house, poor house. Yeah. What? Why did you do that in the first place? I was on holiday in South Africa. My TV. I do a lot of TV about my entrepreneurship and business, and obviously my, my celebrity friends and stuff like that, and my past and. And this TV show, it just came about. And they, they called my TV agent and said, we want Matt Fidesz on. And, and um, I didn't like the name. I said, I don't want to be on a show called Rich House, Poor House. That's mm -hmm. demeaning. You know, just, and the way I understood it is you just swap houses with a family. And that's like, like House Swap. Like this show called House Swap, yeah. So I agreed to do it. But I wanted to, which we'll get on to, I wanted to ban them from mentioning Michael Jackson because... That's been like the biggest shadow, which I'm proud of, but also been the biggest shadow over my career because it was 10 years of my life. And they agreed to that. We had a contract in place and we did this show. And it was life changing because they got to live in our, our big house, mansion. I don't like saying that's all a show off, but that's the reality of it is. And then we got to live in their council house. 
and they struggle, we don't struggle. They lived on our, a greater budget, we lived on their budget. I had to do his job, his night shift and so forth. And um, his wife is disabled, so Millie had to do nothing. I had to learn how to do cooking and cleaning, and I wish I'd never done any of that before stuff. So it was a humbling experience, but it was wonderful for my children because they actually got to see what reality is all about. Mm. Yeah, just like the on last Sunday when I went to this hospice with the supercars, I brought my 10-year-old with me because I wanted him to witness a boy who's eight who's just about to lose his mum in a few days' time because of cancer. So my boy can understand your your reality is not real you know real this is the real world out there mm -hmm. people are dying they're struggling they they would love to have these supercars my my children that's all they've ever known my my oldest in the 20s sure i remember but when she was a baby i had her in the the babysit with the roof down in the ferrari driving around you know it's just not not a normal upbringing it's not their fault but they got born into it so, so i try and keep them grounded so that show was to keep them grounded it was a huge hit because i broke the rules she basically needed a mobility scooter and back then you weren't supposed to help the family or meet them and um she was in a lot of pain and it was ridiculous and it was not a lot of money for me you know it was a couple of grand if i remember rightly and uh, we did a few other things to them as well so i i broke the rules of the format of the program against the tv broadcaster's permission and they just happened to roll the cameras anyway when they came home. And then she found a scooter. She burst into tears. She was able to take the kids to school every day. And it just blew up. My show with the Lehman family just blew up. It went massive. And it was the biggest, I'm told, it's the biggest show they ever had of Rich House, Poor House. And then we had we went back a year later again. We mentored the family. And we're still in contact to this day. I spoke to them last week. Yeah, that was a big life-changing experience. Now they change the show's format now. So now you get to help the family. You expect to help them. And you get to meet them at the end. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was it was a good experience. We I do a lot of shows, but that one was probably the most impacting one that I've done. Absolutely. The, I think the thing I liked about what you were saying about your kids, about keeping them grounded, it also makes them appreciate the value of things. Yeah. Because the last thing you want someone to do is go on that entrepreneur journey and have these materialistic things and they don't really mean anything. Yeah. Because to some people, they mean quite a lot. You know, a brand new car or anything like that means a lot to somebody who, um, so it's, it's kind of like, and, and then you kind of cherish things more, a lot more than you do just kind of wasting, oh, pay for this, pay for that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I could, uh, yeah. I could imagine that could be quite challenging. It's the parents. biggest challenge we have, which is a good problem to have. I know people look like rich people's problems, they say, isn't it? Uh, I, I remember one day I got up and I, I felt a bit down and um, I put it on Instagram actually just to, just to show people that the success is a journey. When you actually get there, you're still going to be the same person. You know, you're just going to have a bit more power, I guess, and resources. But it was a Sunday and I was confused on what car to take. Do I take the Lamborghini or the Ferrari? I was looking at the keys and I thought, this is bloody ridiculous. I would have dreamt about this when I was like, 15 that was my goals so i thought wow this is a reality now so i took a picture of it put on instagram this is my biggest two choices in my life today do i take the lamborghini event or the ferrari f8 you know i dreamt about this be inspired go after your goals dream it believe it achieve it so yeah it's keeping them grounded and also when they go in their friends houses if they got a two up two down normal house i want my kids to understand that is normal they're privileged what daddy daddy is not the normal average person you know and uh and I want them to aspire to be hungry for success themselves too. Did, did, did you find your life got more complicated the more successful you became? Yeah, it got massive. Well, I don't know the other side, do I? So when I look at other families, do you know what's interesting, right? So when I had the, the first Ferrari and I was made my millions in my early 20s, I used to drive round and peer into the light nightclubs at night I used to go like get the blockbuster video for me and my wife or something. And on the way back, I used to drive around and I think, I wonder what it'd be like when you could just walk, be in that nightclub and just be normal, have a normal job at the weekends, be able to chill out, not relax, not have to worry about someone calling in sick or you know a drama in your business, and then just going to work Monday to Friday, clocking off at five, not having your phone ringing all the time. Because the only time I get a ring is a phone call is entrepreneur, really, is when there's a problem, a challenge. Mm -hmm. You need to come up. And so I used to drive around quite often. I remember doing that. And then um, I used to like look at people at McDonald's and think, geez, they must have a real cool life, you know? I'll go for the drive because they got no stresses. They clock off. They go home to their kids, put the TV on. They watch many movies as they want, go to the gym. I can't do that. I've got thousands of people who are relying on me to put food on the table. You know, so yeah, it's in and 
they're probably looking at me thinking, <laughs> you're the crazy. I want to get out of this damn job. I want to be where he is. Yeah. Yeah. Do, 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 do you think your brain is just hardwired to constantly yeah, it's, be it's, active? It's just DNA. On the go. Yeah. It's childhood. People I know who, who are billionaires, entrepreneur, multi-millionaires at another level, they've all been bullied or been fat at school, been teased, or they've been, they've been something or lost loved ones early on. And I think um, that's what motivates you to go on and, and do well. I've got an employee at the moment, and she's 25, and she lost her mum and dad very young in life. She is so ambitious and driven, and she looks so she's so mature for her age. I know she's going to play. She'll be one of my superstars one day. And it's, it's because of that pain she's experienced by losing her dad and her mum so, so young in life and basically having to raise herself. And she's come from South Africa too, Johannesburg. And she's so driven, I can see in her that one day she'll be a millionaire because she's got that fire in her belly to make it happen. But every successful person I know who's gone to another level have had a pain point in their life. Like trauma, adversity. Yeah, like Simon, Simon Carroll, we were talking about him with him last night. Simon, Simon's pain point was when his, he, he lost everything and he had five pound left in his pocket just to get him home in a taxi to his mum mum's house. And then he's like, enough's enough now. And then he broke out and... Pop Idol, X Factor, look what happened to him. One of the richest, most famous men in the world. So they all have a pain point that drives them on to be be successful. Mm, that's interesting. So so um, let's get on to um, your relationship with Michael Jackson. How did that happen? Yeah, it's not normal that, is it? <laughs> no, no, it's not every, no. every day something like that happens. So, so when I was 18, the... The main martial arts school was getting a huge amount of attention. 700 members, the biggest martial arts school in the UK. No one was doing what I was doing. I was the first guy to put people on direct debits. Um, you know, long story short, I, I, I heard from a mutual friend called Lee who went on a holiday in America. And that they were always like 20 years ahead of us. And he said to me, Matt, there's martial arts business owners out there, multimillionaires, they've got high standards. I wanted high standards. That was very important to me. And... Um, I saved up my £2.75 as a lifeguard and my £3 the class martial arts classes and I got a flight out to a conference in San Francisco. It was a three-day one and there were all there were over a 1,000 people there. And the owner of the conference who ran the conference, this organisation, which is about business for the martial arts niche, he took me under his wing. He was in his 80s because he thought this you know, this 18-year-old used his last money. I've, and it's UK. It's a bit good case study. So he told me, I don't know if it's going to work in England, but go and study this person, this person, this person, follow them around. It's like all around Florida and places like that. You used to get up at four in the morning, take notes down and work with the greats. It's quite interesting now because they come to me for advice now, these people are in their 60s, and they come for me and study my what I do. And I came back to UK with all these notepads of informa information and implemented it. So I just disrupted the whole martial arts. It's been not changed a thousand years. I had music on the lessons. And um, rather than when you wouldn't punish kids when they do something wrong, you, you used to say do ten press ups, and you you know public praise, private reprimand, we call it. Mm. And I made this educational system, which I had to rewrite because the American one didn't work. Like the high fives and the hugging didn't go to, went down too well in the UK. Like what the hell are you doing? And um, it blew up. And I had this reporter come up to me in the reception of my main martial arts school in Barnstable, and he said. Matt, I work for a Southwest news agency. I supply stories to them. I know you've got no qualifications from school. I know you're bullied. You've got a nice car out there. You're clearly making a million or so plus a year. And um, do you mind if I interview you and, and get a picture of you in the car? I said, yeah, no problem at all. And we did that. And I just went for the local paper or something. And um, he, he found a picture of me too when I was like six years old. My school picture where I looked very nice, vulnerable, probably the word, like bullied kid. And then that was it. He went away. I heard him for a few days. And then, yeah, mainstream media was massive back then. I mean, the national papers again, 20 million pickups per day at the shops. The landline was going off the hook. What the hell's going on? And I went to the newsstand and I was on the front page of every single national newspaper there was. Bully Boy becomes a millionaire. And I had a picture of me doing a punch, a picture of me in the car, a picture of me when I was the young, the young kid. And on the back of that, I did all the TV shows because researchers go to the things like podcasts now too, and social media, and newspapers to find good studies for TV shows. I did all the morning TV shows, Kilroy, Trisha, Esther Ramson, Richard and Judy. And on the back of that, um, Yuri Geller was watching, who was world famous, probably no more for bending spoons in the UK, but he's world famous for positive thinking and power of the mind. 
very successful guy. When you're famous in every country of the world, you're onto something. And he's 70, or nearly 78 now, and he's got the Yuri Geller Museum in Israel, and he's still healthy. He's an unbelievable guy to be surrounded around, so positive at such a young age. And he took me under his wing. We planned to make these VHS videos to give out to kids where I would do the anti-bullying self-defense moves and he would do positive thinking. Instead, we did like a fitness combination. I did kickboxing aerobics, he did positive thinking. And we became close friends. And then one day, just madly, at three o'clock in the morning, he called my landline at home at my house in Barnstable. And he, uh, it's not unusual for him to do that because he's got companies all around the world and he's famous in a place like Australia. So he, he needs to be up late for the TV shows. So says, hi, Yuri, what's up? Matt, you need to come to my house right now. I said, okay, well, you've got to tell me why. He said, I can't tell you why. You just need to get in a car, come in a car now. I said, well, I'm going to take my missus, you know. I'm going right three in the morning to Southern on Thames in Reading. It's, it's a three-hour drive, three and a half-hour drive from here. So stop moaning. You've got a Ferrari. Get in your car. Go. I love you. Put the phone down. And that was it. A massive row with the other half. <laughs> got on the car. Get to his house. Gates open up. Go down to his mansion. He's got like a replica of the White House. Incredible place. And um, walk into his living room. And um, this frail guy walks up to me and bows. He says, hi, Master Fidesz. My name's Michael Jackson. Pleased to meet you. Put his hand out shake my hand. And I know you are. What the hell are you doing here? And initially, I just thought it was one of these prank shows because back then there was all these prank shows going on and my profile was very high. I thought Yuri might have set me up with his TV prank show, but no, he's the real deal. And yeah, we spent a lot of time together. That was about a week talking and just got on really well. And and um, we, we were buddies and he said he'll give me a call i asked him for his number actually and he said he doesn't have one because he's so famous people just harass him silly and he took my number so i thought i'm never gonna hear from this guy again it took a while about three or four weeks later he left an answer phone message on my my main martial arts school in Barcelona. my little brother called me up saying you wouldn't effing believe who's left the message here <laughs> michael jackson he couldn't believe it he's kept playing it about 50 times over and over again and i, and I drove down to the school and it was michael and yeah, went out to New York, spent some time with him. He's recording his album, Invincible. And, um, yeah, we became best buddies. And about a year or so later, because I was, I had big muscles back then. I was a martial arts guy and I was his mate. I felt he was vulnerable. Whenever we'd go out in public, he would get mobbed by paparazzi and the public. I, I just I used to put my arm around and protect him and I became his, his bodyguard. And in the end, I said to Michael, you spend all this crazy money out. He lost his long-term bodyguards. I'll, I'll take over your security operation. I want nothing from you. I don't want no money, nothing. I don't want a transactional relationship. I've made my money. And um, because of that, it, it worked. You did it all for free? Did it all for free. And not only just me, I had my brother-in-law who would be the person outside the room at night when he slept to make sure that I don't want to try and get in where he's sleeping. We're in hotels around the world. And then I could supply him lots of martial arts people who are security people. And uh, because, yeah, and... It worked really well. So right from like 98 through to 2004, I would do all the big events with him and his personal security as well. And um, yeah, and then after that period, I became more of a friend up until he died. So when he came to London, me and his best friend, Mark Lester, would go and visit him at his hotel, have dinner with him, go shopping with him, go to America and hang out with him and stuff like that. Or go to Florida and, and chill out. Um, um, right up to the end the last time I spoke to him was two days before he passed away but yeah he became my uh, he was like a mentor to me he taught me how to franchise so he took these this plan of the five schools and he wrote it on a napkin this is what you got to do now you got to build a brand manipulate mainstream media you need to put everything in a manual and a system and he kept me accountable so he used to ring the house all the time how many schools you opened up I used to dodge his phone calls you know, as much as I possibly could yeah but I, unbeknown to me from that age, 18 years old, I was part of, you call it a mastermind nowadays, wouldn't you? Mm, yeah. But then it was networking. I was part of this unbelievable network where I was meeting up for dinners with the owner of Harrods, Muhammad al Fad, billionaire who was mentoring me uh, over the dinner table and yeah, Britney Spears and Daryl Hannah and yeah, Yuri Geller and, um, and Michael was just, they're, they're just all so inspiring from the property side to the business side to branding. It was all there. You couldn't make it up. You you couldn't even buy yourself into a situation like that. W yeah. w would you um, say a big part of your success has been based on having good mentorship throughout your your entrepreneurial journey? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. If I never had those mentors, then I, I didn't see them as mentors back then. Though they were just my buddies. Mm. 
I knew they were a bit famous and that they couldn't go out with me. And when I got married for the first time, I drew up my list who can attend and everyone literally needed security detail. So then I realized that there's only like one person that didn't need bodyguards and security. So I, they all bowed out on my famous friends and and it was, yeah, but the people who should have been there didn't, didn't come because they didn't want it to be about them. But yeah, it, they were my mentors. And when you you become the five people you mix with and what you consume, the podcast nowadays you, you watch, the stuff you consume on the internet, the movies you watch, the books you read, and it's important to control that. So for me, I had these incredible people around me, mm. but I didn't look at them as mentors. They were just my mates. But of course, I was picking up on them talking about how to make their next billion, how to fill stadiums, how to make news. And... Nothing was off the table. Uh, there's a saying, right? Small minds talk. Small minds talk about people. Medium minds talk about things, and uh, great minds talk about ideas. And around the dinner tables of that lot, whenever I used to meet up with them in hotels and Muhammad Afia's house in Oxted, they used to talk about incredible ideas. They weren't talking about small stuff. It was about next level, and it was about the money for them, about how they could stop global warming, how they can change the world, stop hunger. It was big time thinking, you know, and just just randomly talking about how to make the next billion. And for me, being hit with that in my early 20s, it's going to have an impact on you, mm, isn't it? Yeah, a, very, a positive one, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. considering you knew where you wanted to go. Positive one. And also you're going to have that drive to think, cause I wanted to beat Mike. I know it sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> he was making like 80 million a year just off his Beatles catalogue investment. That's without all the other stuff he was earning. And I wanted to kick his butt, but uh, yeah. That was uh, a goal. <laughs> We're gonna, he started a lot younger than me. He started when he was five. So, and and, and you mentioned earlier about the um, the rich house, poor house, uh, mentioning Michael Jackson, and you saw it as a bit of a shadow. Yeah, ha, ha, has it? Obviously, I can see the positive impact it's had in your life. But what was the negative impact it had in your life? Well, it took a lot of getting used to. But do you know the interesting thing, George? George, when I met Michael, he said to me, um, "You're going to be my friend." And just like a kid in a playground would say, you're going to be my friend. And I'm like, wow, are you, are you serious? Of course I'm going to be your mate. Yeah, just that if you're going to be my friend, your life will never be the same again. I don't care about that, Mike. You know, it's fine. But he knew, he knew that by hanging out with him and being associated to him, forget the bodyguard in part of it, that um, it's going to rub off. There's a thing called fame by association. Mm. And um, well, I've heard guilty of it. Uh, by association and guilty well. by association too absolutely so so it was a wild ride and now when he passed away it was interesting because I was always known as the martial arts millionaire martial arts tycoon martial arts guru martial arts expert champion whatever celebrity personal trainer whatever it may be as soon as Mike died it became martial uh, Michael Jackson's bodyguard was mm. anything right people write about me Michael Jackson's body. I used to drive my freaking head in. Mm. So much so, I used to go to counselling for it. Did you? Yeah. And and some of his family members, they all went to counselling too. Because when someone dies and you're close to them, you go for a bereavement process. But when it's Michael Jackson, everywhere you go, his music is playing. Everyone wants to talk about it. Even now, 15 years on, everyone wants to talk about Mike. There's not a day that goes past I don't get a message about Michael. And it's, it's ironic. I'll go into a, a restaurant and Billy Jean will come on, you know, or mm. Way Frillo will come on and... You just can't get away from it. Yeah. So it was quite tough to deal with. Mm. And the, yeah, I, I used to moan about it. I said, why do they always put Michael Jackson? Because it looks like I'm using my friend. And I see this a lot with Michael too. The biggest problem I have with Mike over the course of the 10 years is that people used to use him for money or fame by association. And they've only like met him for like seconds, you know, and people claiming that they've been bodyguards when they've been actually fact a security guard and they've probably seen him for about 15 seconds holding back a railing. And it, it annoys me and, and and that really gets on my nerves. So so I didn't want to be seen as using Michael because the bodyguard bit was the first four years. Then Nation of Islam took over. Then he had his trial. Then he had a different team. And I had kids by this point, right? So I couldn't just drop my... my, my get on a plane whenever he wanted me to. I could oversee things with distance and be his mate but from 2004 onwards I was at a di a, as a distance more as a mate to him so I found it a bit unfair that the media would always label me as Michael Jackson's bodyguard mm. very rarely now do I get any media coverage that doesn't have that in front of it even I put an Instagram post out 
and don't mention him at all. It'll, the press will pick up on it and they'll put Matt Fidesz, the multi-millionaire martial arts tycoon, formerly Michael Jackson bodyguard, and I think, ah, oh, God, leave me, a, leave it alone, will ya? It's like just four years of my life. Why? I was mates with him for ten years. Why? Why on earth? I just feel that like if he was alive, I don't want to be seen as riding off the back of someone else's fame. But I can't get away from it. I never will. Mm. Uh, so how I come to terms in the end, I became friends with Alfred Presley's bodyguard, who's also a martial artist, and he was a champion, much more than me, a guy called Bill Superfoot Wallace. And Bill said, Bill was bodyguard for, for Alvis and his martial arts teacher, and also John Belushi, one of the Blues Brothers. And um, I said, um, it really bothers me, Bill. And he goes, why? Well, I, I get John Belushi and Alvis. And, and I said, John, John Belushi, he actually found him dead, Bill did. He said, you've got to see this as an honor. Like, this is the most famous man in the world, and you're linked to that. No one can ever recreate that again. Just embrace it. It's never going to go away. And I used to tell my PR team, can we just get rid of this Michael Jackson thing now? I've got my own career. Mm. I've made my success. It's got nothing to... Other than him teaching me the franchise, which I was being around the right people, just, uh, just you know, can't we get rid of it? You can't. But no, I understand it now. I mean, I get it. It's like, if you put this podcast out, and you just put interview with Matt Fidesz, multi-millionaire, martial arts tycoon, biggest chain of martial arts schools in the world, it'll do okay. Mm. As soon as you put exclusive secrets of Michael Jackson bodyguard, the bloody thing goes viral like crazy. I, I get it. And it's clickbait, isn't it, with the social media age too. Is is The heading will be about Michael, then they click on it, and they get to the real story. Uh, like our story here is more in-depth, but if you want it to go viral, you're going to have to, Michael's still, in, even in-depth, the biggest earning pop star in the world, entertainer in the world, and most famous man in the world, and one of the most Googled in the world. So I get it. I, I've, I've embraced it, but it took me a long time to... I, I was very mindful about that before this podcast started. That was quite... I didn't want to make this whole conversation about Michael Jackson. Yeah, and I think yeah. you've done quite a good job of understanding... You have. Matt is, uh, it's unusual, actually. To, to, Thanks to for that. <laughs> but I do actually... I'll be very curious to know, you know, what he was like as a person. Sure. and um, I think if you don't talk about it, then your viewers will think, what are you trying to hide? Yeah, Because yeah, that's yeah. what I'm most known for, isn't it? Because mm. it's, it's just, uh, like last night, I wouldn't, would I have been out of that event if it weren't for Michael Jackson? Probably not, because I kind of met that the Cowell family through me bringing the Jacksons to a children's hospice many years ago. And my association with him had doors, which could help raise money. So yeah, it's all, it all works. But no, I've learned to accept it now, and I'm proud to be his mate. And um, to, to, Told how it was someone who was actually there, you know, really actually there. Um, so, so give me your hard time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so obviously with with Michael, there was the the the, the positive side to your relationship. Did you ever? He, he, to me, it seemed like he was quite a trouble. While he was done some amazing things, he also seemed quite troubled. Did you did you notice that from the beginning? He, he was he was very sad. He used to say um, he was the loneliest. He felt like he was the loneliest man on earth, and he'd have a thousand fans chanting his name all night outside the hotel that we were staying in. Uh, I won't say he troubled, but he was very lonely, very isolated, too damn famous for any human being to cope with. I mean, it was just I can't even describe it. You could go on YouTube and put Matt Fidesz, Michael Jackson in, and watch what it was like when we used to try and move around London or try and catch a train or just go shopping at HMV to buy some records. And, and within minutes, the whole of Oxford Street would be shut down. I mean, it was just unbelievable fame, which will never be seen again, I don't think. So I won't say troubled, but lonely, unhappy, and um, a little bit, I couldn't understand why the world could understand him and um, why, why people just couldn't get what he was about. No one would believe him or what he would say, like about his skin disease, which has been proven now. He had an autopsy when he died, vitiligo. That's why he's white, you know, he's a black man, obviously, but he's very proud of his black heritage. Um, he's confused by the way why the world didn't understand him. But then he was so famous from five years old that he had a different view on the world. And the only piece, the only time I saw that guy happy, Michael, was when he was with his children, Prince, Paris, or Blanket, or when he was on stage. The rest of the time, it was, he was okay. But he was never, yeah, he, he was never happy. And, and, and you know, it's, it's well known now. There's doctors trying to keep him happy through ways that he shouldn't have been. And he saw that as a doctor giving it to him, so it's okay. It's prescription medicine is not. He wouldn't touch hardcore drugs, that guy. I mean, I never had my first alcoholic drink until I was 27 because Michael 
was so tough on me. No nightclubs, no alcohol, no smoking, none of that. Because when he was trying to get famous with the Jackson 5, they would tour these nightclubs and he would see what would go on late at night with the drugs and the women. And mm. So oddly enough, he was so tough on me. And he would be like, if you ever touch alcohol, I'm never going to speak to you again. I'm going to make your life hell. And yeah, he, he was tough on me. And, and it's sad that he died of a drug overdose, but he didn't see that. He saw his medicine, mm. you know. And when he did die, for me, he's got like 1,800 franchises now around the world and hundreds of thousands of kids who worship, idolize what I do, I'm, I'm their idol. It was difficult because the parents were like, well, your best friend is Michael, it's all over the newspapers. Can you please explain to my kid because he won't take his medicine tonight because he's worried it's what's going to happen. Like he's not going to wake up like Michael Jackson didn't wake up. So I had to explain the difference between hardcore drugs and medicine and the doctor gives it to you, it's okay. But, but yeah, Michael's famous, just this unbelievable tycoon that I know lots of famous people, but nothing like that. Nothing like that. I, I remember one event, Yuri Geller's wedding, Michael Jackson was best man, and we had everyone who's anyone there, like big stars. And Michael came in last because he's always late for everything, which is the way Michael worked. He's two and a half hours late, even though he's best man. He had the ring, so we couldn't even start the proceedings. He had Yuri Geller's wife's ring there, the, the wedding ring. He turns up, takes his seat, and I was there in more of an informal capacity at the time. I wasn't his bodyguard as such, I ended up being though. And uh, I sat next to Michael and um, Yuri got married. Yuri, he handed, Michael handed a ring, his best man. And at the end of that event, uh, uh, as the ceremony finished, everybody, they're all big now, I won't mention their names, so I don't have permission, but they all mob Michael Jackson for an autograph and a picture. They flipping mobbed him, like big star names there. And I, I had to, take him and lock him in a room in Yuri Geller's house to keep all the other celebrities and superstars away from him. He was like the superstar of superstars. It's, it's just a fame that will never, never be seen again, I don't think. And I wasn't sure if I've heard this right, but what was his relationship like with his family, Michaels, and his, his father? Was he, did he have quite a tough upbringing um, with his dad? Yeah, well, he did, but then... If you look at the other side, when you speak to his brothers, they'll say to you, well, none of them have ended up being hardcore drugs. They've not been criminals. They were brought up in Gary, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And um, the da dad was extreme. The family were poor, like nine kids in a two-bed, tiny little bungalow house. And dad was trying to earn the living. Well, sometimes he had work, sometimes he didn't at the steel mill. And the neighbors used to have to bring the money around. He was tough on them. But the other, the, the other Jacksons... They didn't resent him for it. Now, Michael was very sensitive. If he's talking about Jermaine or Tito or someone like that, they're, they're tough, you know, or Jackie Jackson. They're different. They won't take this nonsense. They won't take this... Uh, I remember once Jermaine Jackson... Steven Seagal was uh, saying bad things about Michael. And Jermaine heard about it. He wasn't happy. And there was a movie premiere. And Steven Seagal was there and Jermaine was there. And Jermaine went up to him face to face and he said to me, Jermaine said to me, man, I didn't know what I was going to do, but I had my fist clenched. <laughs> it's like, so I was against Steven Seagal, but I'm not having people talk about my brother Michael like that. Michael was very sensitive. Like if he watched a movie or watch a, the news and there's children in Africa die and he'll start crying, you know, give millions away to charity and he'll pay for operations. That's kind of how he influenced me to do all that type of things. Or want to go to Carball City in London, which was a thing back then. And hand out pizza not money to them all he was super sensitive whereas the others weren't so later on in life i got to witness this i was very privileged we were doing us he was doing a speech at oxford union and we were traveling from london and he had a rabbi called rabbi shmuley batek batek there with us and, and the rabbi was traveling as like a spiritual advisor to michael and the speech at the oxford union contained lots of bad things about his dad about in fact his dad was tough on him and and he did have a normal childhood and he did have a choice to be Michael Jackson and so on. And he got rehearsed too hard and all this type of stuff. And I rather said, look, look at where you are. You're the biggest selling artist in the world. Um, you, none, none of you or your brothers or your sisters have turned to, to drugs and gone to jail. You're out of Gary, Indiana. Look what's happened to your family. Maybe it's time to forgive your father and thank him for what he did. And uh, they um, done it, Michael Umdenar, and he said, he said to me, he said, Matt, do you have... Joseph's number. He used to call him Joseph because that's the way it was. Joseph said, don't call me dad. I'll call me Joseph. He wanted to keep it quite professional. And I knew where Joseph was. He was in Las Vegas. So 
I dialed the number up for Michael, handed it to Michael, and Michael, loudspeaker, spoke to Joseph. And he said, hi, he said, I, hi, uh, Joseph, this is Michael Jackson, and I'm on the way to Oxford Union, I'm going to talk about you. And he said, oh, no. And he said, oh, don't worry, I just wanted to ring you up to let you know, I want to say sorry for everything I said about you in the Oprah Winfrey win interview, and I understand what you did now, I'm a father now myself. I get you just meant you wanted the best for us and me and my brothers and my sisters and I want to apologize and I'm going to talk good of you and I just just want to say sorry and I understand you now. And from that point onwards, they had a great relationship. That was like 2001. That was, yeah, all throughout the trial. Joseph was there every day. When he got, when Joseph Jackson got wind that things weren't good in the final months of Michael's life, he was trying to get to Michael and always had his best interests at heart. So, yeah, I mean, it's like any family, right? You, you got, you got Michael's very different. You've got people around him in his ear. You've got an entourage. And then you've got Jermaine, who's got people around him and, and, and so on. And Janet's got her own thing going on. And so, yeah, they, they were as close as they could be, given the circumstances that they all got their own managers in their ear, their own people. But, yeah, when they got together, they, they were just a family they were just a family I spent Jackson Day with them they have some, once a year called Jackson Day and we had a barbecue in Los Angeles and yeah they were all hanging out they were just, they were just cool so funny yeah hilarious so, so, so what was your um, perspective of what happened with the Neville, Neverland situation you know it was all, all over the news and you must have been still yeah, quite yeah, involved yeah. In, in his life that's a big point. decision to make. I had one of the, the biggest like children's organization in the world and then my mate's been uh, arrested and charged with 14 counts of child molestation. So, yeah, but I knew, I knew it was BS, rubbish, because I was with Michael, you know, at the time. I know what he's like. I, I know the situation. He's not into freaking kids. He's into women. That was well known. In our little inner circle, he he had girlfriends and, and um, but he was trained by Motown not to show the fans that he had any sexuality whatsoever because it, the old school thinking was to cut off your fan base. Mm -hmm. So when Tito Jackson was the first Jackson to get married, Michael was devastated. Well, that's the end of the Jackson five. He's never going to sing again. And then Jermaine got married and they started to really like open up to the idea a little bit more, but he didn't want to upset his fans. He wanted the fans to think one day they could marry him and all this type of stuff. But yeah, we got footage of it in the cars, but it's, it's interesting, George, isn't it? Cause it's like council culture has become a thing. Now mm -hmm. people understand it. It's starting to, it's starting to be exposed. Whereas back then, everyone just assumes Michael was a paedophile and weird, wacky, crazy nuts. You don't get to be the most famous man in the world, a multi-billionaire, biggest son of album of all time, and stay relevant all those years, unless you're a super smart dude. That guy used to study the greatest, used to read three to five books per week, would study Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins talks about him in his personal power program. He, he was just the... He knew all about personal development. His friends with Deepak Chopra and people like that. He was one of the smartest dudes I ever knew. That guy was incredible. And um, yeah, the, the the whole vulnerability. I mean, when the bigger the star, the bigger the target. You look what's going on with. I don't know Andrew Tate, but I know people who know Andrew Tate, and that's another example there, isn't it? Andrew Tate. Did he get too big? So big that he was too damn powerful. And they want to bring him down with Michael Jackson. They hit him with young boys, which is stupid. Because when you're around Michael, he built Neverland. And over 10,000 children a year used to be bussed into there for Make-A-Wish Foundation. And most of the time, he wasn't around. And it wasn't young boys. It was girls and boys. And he used to hang around. He's, he's, there's a lot of Jacksons, right? So he had lots of nieces and nephews around. Not just the nephews, the nieces too. And all the, it was just all nonsense. But the media went to attack him and... Obviously, you had the Martin Bashir thing. I was present in that meeting, and Bashir told him it was going to be a positive documentary. We're going to kill the myths, focus your music, not film your kids, and look what happened there. And after that, after that time, I used to tell people all the time that he got out this crumpled note from Princess Diana, and he convinced Michael to do this documentary. That's what did it, because Sir David Frost wanted to do it, and Louis Farouk, but he wanted the Diana person because Michael was friends with Diana. And, they, you know... He screwed Michael over, completely screwed him over. Hold the boy's hand, Michael, with people who were saying, people at Neverland were telling me, he's like, oh, Martin Ma Ma would say, get closer to him, Michael, hold his hand. And he's like, oh, Michael, I don't, shouldn't do that. I know, like, oh, it's okay, what are, you, what are you worried about? And um, talk about sleeping on your bed and all this type of stuff. And they all say, no, I sleep on the floor. He goes on the bed, I give up my bed, I sleep on the floor. And he's talking about his bedroom, which is on two floors with you know, three or four bathrooms, arcade games and 
Yeah, it's huge. It's the only privacy he got, you know, and a panic room, which they call the secret sex room, all this nonsense. But it's just, I, I always see Mike as the, the first Me Too campaign target. Got too big, too powerful. I mean, he was worshipped like a king wherever he went in the world. Just everyone just bowed down for him. Presidents wanted to meet him. I used to get phone calls from President Clinton all the time, wanting to speak to Michael. And, and, um, he got tried to take him out, and they couldn't. And people like Andrew Tate, they're, they're trying it with female sex trafficking. Mm. You see what's going on, Russell Brand, the trial by media is the word I'm looking for. There's no substance behind it. You can't just make a TV program, put it out. Uh, there's been no charges, per, no no one's gone to the police. You can't just go, they don't want to use fake names, they don't want to use their real faces. I mean, that's nonsense. Mm. You've ruined someone's career like that. And you can go on and on with names like this, can't you? Um, People have been put in jail where for something they'd so say done 30, 40 years ago and they can't even remember. So I, I think council culture is a thing now. But back then, Michael was probably the first victim of it. I think he was the first, got too powerful. The biggest, powerful, most famous man in the world. He owned half of Sony Music. He owned people's records like Eminem and the Beatles catalogue. And a lot of people wanted to get to Michael Jackson or take him out. They had enough. What, what, what was the situation with um, Eminem? Because I... I... I I heard about he he bought some rights. Yeah, so so we were in a hotel. So it was it was an awkward moment. Came out of the blue. He like he had he adored Eminem's as an artist, his music. He didn't know him though, and this music video came on. It was called Just Lose It, and it, there's like a little line in there that says I don't touch boys like Michael, and and they had like a Michael Jackson lookalike, and they threw his nose across the room, and the hair thing. That's serious for Michael, right? He it was like fourth degree burns to his skull and never really recovered from it he had his had to his or head was reconstructed and it was an agonizing pain how, how did that happen the pepsi commercial he was his brothers and he was recording a pyrotechnic went up went off and it lit his fire and teaser told me about it he's said he's one of the first people to run over there with a bucket of water to put it out michael did spins to try and put it out and he got rushed to hospital so this this is like a mockery that eminem did of michael and Anyway, we're watching it. He, he didn't really react. I said, "You're not upset by that." Said, nah, it's, it's one of those, another one. Just another one, man. Just another one. You know. So he said, "I'm upset because I, I I admire Eminem as an artist, but um, it is what it is. So I can't change it." You know? So if he thinks it's okay to do that, then so be him. You know. But I respect him as an artist. But maybe I've changed my mind. And he left it at that. I was expecting him to get the lawyers involved and sue or do something. Yeah. About about a month or so later. His best friend, Mark Lester, called me. He said, you wouldn't believe what Michael's done. I said, what's happened? He's bought all of Eminem's music. So I said, what the hell would he do that for? I said, i got no idea. And I met with him. And I said, Michael, you bought Eminem's music? And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. So why'd you know? Do you remember that music video he did about me? Yeah. I said, well, I thought about the best thing, the way to handle it. I bought all of his songs. So whenever he wants to play his music, he has to pay me or ask me permission. I thought, wow, this guy's like... That's a kick in the teeth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I don't know what, what Eminem thought of that, but uh, yeah, it's a bit like when Paul McCartney wanted all the songs he wrote, he had to ask Michael for permission. Yeah, that's yeah. It. I didn't even know um, you could do that to uh, buy Yeah, well, them. initially record, record companies, they own your songs because you've got no money, you're nobody, they mm -hmm. paint the picture, they own your songs. So you, the, all these artists perform these amazing, write these amazing songs and, and um, don't own them. They've got to fight to get them back later somehow. So Eminem's got them back now, I think. I think he's got them back. And then Paul McCartney... I'm not sure if he's got the Beatles catalogue back or not. Actually, I don't know how that's worked out. So, so, so what was the the best advice you ever got from Michael Jackson? God, he gave me so much best advice. I mean, he was like, practice, practice, practice. Don't give up. Um, uh, whatever you dream, you can you can make it happen. And uh, be around the right people. That was one thing. The media. He had a love hate relationship. He liked to make up stories to get in the media, but then also they're a pain. A lot of the time when, when he was trying to have a normal life, um, like the goal set him. So one thing, you know, I think it's still there now, in his house in Havenhurst, in his bedroom, you got the stairs and then on his mirror, he wrote, I want the biggest selling, looks like I did my exercise book at school. I want the biggest selling mm -hmm. album of all time. I want to sell over 100 million records. Because he did Off the Wall and he didn't get any Oscars for it or any awards. It, you know, he's, he's very upset about that. So he went for it, he set these huge goals. And he wrote them on the mirror because every day he woke up and he looked in the mirror and he focused on, he visualized on that. So goal setting was a big thing with Michael. And in the end, he, the next album was Thriller, which sold over 100 million out records. And it's still to this day, 
It's the biggest standout album of all time. So I think um, being driven, goal setting, you can do whatever you want to do. Get the right mentors. Don't listen to the dream stealers. And think big. And um, yeah. Uh, and all, you know the other big lessons to give him back? The stuff you don't see about him, he's one of the biggest donators of charities ever. I think it's 750 million he's given to charities. And the Guinness Book of Records for that. I saw him paying for people's funerals behind, like children's funerals and adults' funerals, so they couldn't afford it. They didn't know it was Michael Jackson. We used to, we used to have to do that for him. Uh, uh, giving back, being humble, and uh, yeah, all the things you see me do now, like turning up at hospices and helping kids out and trying to raise money for life-saving treatment. Then he he taught the value of that, that if you give back, then you'll get back more in return. Mm. He really understood yeah, that. I, I believe in that as well. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just quite funny about the news and the media, how they see all of the, the donations, that side of thing as that should be done. And then they always leach onto the kind of negatives um, and they publicize all the stuff that people, yeah. do, the, the wrongdoings. So it's, it's a bit... Um, in that documentary, the Martin Bashir one, if you go and turn up the sound... So you have you have a, like a, a narrator. Martin's talking over it. It was a car crash documentary. Don't get me wrong. But if you turn up the sound, when you see female fans in their early twenties who are trying to meet Michael, and Michael say, "Let them come and meet me. It's okay." And they say, "Michael, can I give you a hug?" He say, "Sure, you give me a hug." And then you'll hear him, but they turn it down. You've got to turn the TV up. You say, "Then he says, I'll give you more than a hug." You know, he's into women, but. They all knew, they, they they turn it down and they put the narration over it. So then the hope you wouldn't hear him say, "I'll give you more," because they're trying to paint him to be a child molester, a predator for the whole thing. If you go back and watch that documentary, there's a scene of a blonde girl, and he used to call them fish. So when we're in the back of the car, he said, "That's a nice fish. I like that fish. She's she's gorgeous. Look at her." And uh, this particular one, he liked, and uh, she said, "Can I have a hug, Michael?" Said, yeah, of course you can. And he goes, "Hugs only. I'll give you more than a hug." And they turn it down like, "You can't believe they just done that. That would just." vindicate him instantly that he's just not into young boys or this freaking nonsense and there are so many of those moments i could tell you about where, where the mainstream media have mismanaged edited the, the way they want and when there's allegations these two lads tried to get him in 2018 whenever it is for this other tv program I had all the media ringing me up and I had a very big publication in america ringing me up saying we want to talk to you about michael and about these two guys wade and james and um, I said, well, you know he's into women. There's girls who've published books who've been with him, with pictures with him. There's video footage. There's other bodyguards where you, we have to put the screen up because he's snogging some girl in the back. Why don't you ring this girl who was with him to his dying days and interview her? And the journalist editor will say, Matt, we know about her, but we don't want to interview her. It goes against the narrative. Mm. And we're, we're after clickbait. We don't want to hear about that. I was like, oh, yeah, I can't believe it. I just put the phone down. It was unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, impossible. But now, since he's since he's gone, you've seen it happen to so many people, haven't you? you yeah, you have. Yeah, they, it's become it, a thing now. It fits the narrative. And, yeah. But the good thing about social media is it's actually allowing people to see things through a different lens. Yeah. Because it's just this big propaganda machine that's forcing everyone to to kind of feed them this medicine. Yeah. But the good thing about a lot of influencers out there is they're, they're exposing they, they're, some they're level of a, a truth. They're doing it. And it, it's, 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 it's happening now. I think people watch someone on TV now, they're going to question it. Like that TV program that's four hours long trying to convince you that Michael Jackson was a paedophile. If it, they didn't mention the fact that two guys have sued the estate and uh, Michael's not here defending himself anymore, they both sued the estate for hundreds of millions of dollars each. On what ha grounds? That they abused him, the suffering. Oh. But he's been he's been dead twelve years at the time. But don't mention that if you're making a four hour documentary about Michael Jackson, at least include the fact that you're suing the Michael Jackson estate mm. for hundreds of millions of dollars each. So I think a lot of people would turn the channel off of all that nonsense because mm. these two guys gave evidence in the first trial in two thousand and five that nothing ever happened. It was all a load of rubbish, you know. So yeah, so sometimes you, you get do, pulled in. You get pulled in. You do wonder as well, like how much of it was to do with the publicity. The fate, the the money that came attached to it, yeah, you know, and and it's pretty hard to defend yourself once you die as well, isn't it? So I think he had that issue where people were still there was all that stigma yeah. and news. Well, the problem is in '93, I went around. I was at school, obviously, but I, obviously I got friends around him. In '93, he he's now this, this is the misunderstanding. It gets printed like this big, right? Jordan Chandler accused him for his parents of 
being molested. And rather than file a criminal case, which I don't know if you've got kids, George, but I've got six. If anyone molested my kids, I want them freaking hung, shot, or whatever. I'll get my shotgun out. If I haven't got one, I'll go and buy a shotgun and make it happen. And, um, yeah, they filed a civil suit for money in 93. They didn't go to the police. They filed a civil suit. The police then contacted the family, and they said, nah, we don't want to get the police involved. We just want the money. About a year before, the same family approached Michael, and Evan Chandler, Geordie Chandler's dad, wanted Michael to finance a movie project. It went on to become a film called Men in Tights. And um, he, did, he declined to do it. And this guy got angry. There's tapes, recordings, because Michael hired a private investigator saying, if I go through with this, I'm going to win big time. If I go through these allegations, I'm going to win. All a complete constructive thing. So Michael said, no, no, no. I want to fight this damn thing. I want to go to court and file criminal charges against me. Because the civil thing could take years. And he was in the middle of a world tour called Dangerous. So two airplanes, some of Boris for seven, there was thousands of staff, tickets all over the world. Incredible position to be in. But unfortunately, it's out of his hands. He signed a contract with Sony Music. So his insurers, insurance company, sat him down and said, listen, Mr. Jackson, you know, we, you can make billions out of this tour. You need to get back on the road again. And get on with your life. It's, you know, I don't know what the settlement was, but they say around 20 million. So the insurance company is going to pay out whether you like it or not. And he's like, no, I want to go to court. I want to, I want to fight this damn thing out. And he said, you can. And they're not. They hasn't filed a criminal court. And the police asked the boy and the parents, do you want to, do you want to file a criminal court? They don't want to do it. They just want the money. So the insurance company, against Michael's will, paid the money. Michael had to go back on tour again. And that's where the stigma is attached. People don't understand that. Mm -hmm. Michael did not pay the money. It was an insurance company. He was forced to do it. He wanted to go and fight it and put the whole the whole tour off. And it would take years because these cases do. And that would be that. Interestingly enough, about about five years ago, Geordie Chandler came out. And, so after Michael died, Evan Chandler, Geordie's dad, who made these allegations that his son was molested by Michael, shot himself after Michael died. Geordie Chandler divorced his parents early on. In his in his teens, he didn't want it because he felt he was pressured to lie about what happened with him and Michael Jackson. After Michael died, Evan Chandler shot himself. Um, he's, he's got no relationship with his mum, and he spoke to the media and said, I, "I got told by my parents to make it all up." And the Jackson family got quite excited for Jody Chandler's finally told the truth, and they hold nothing against him at all. They're like, "He was just a young boy, yeah. manipulated by his parents." Yeah. He's told the truth. It's fantastic. The freaking press printed it about this big. Yeah. And it's, you've got to really Google it to find it. Geordie Chandler says that it's, uh, they got made to do it by his parents. But had he not done that, paid that, the insurance company had not paid that off, it, the stigma wouldn't have been there. And then the 2005 kid wouldn't have gone for it. And, um, but yeah. You go, you go, how many, how many kids has this guy met, right? Flipping heck. Mm. You get this mobbed everywhere he goes, you know? And uh, yeah, he made some fatal mistakes. Like, being on TV saying um, they sleep in my bedroom and, and you're in your 40s, that's not normal. But then his life's not normal. And he was also made to tell you that. He was, he was kind of like coached into it, you know. He's, and he hasn't got a normal bedroom either. So it's, it's the size of this. Yeah, we're in an apartment building. It's probably twice the size of this. It's huge. Yeah, because that's the only sanctuary place he had. So, And he didn't view the, the world like everyone else did. He didn't think everyone would think he's like... Uh, a criminal or anything because he's married he's got kids he's even at least marie presley was married to him you know but he, mm -hmm. they're soon to forget about all that yeah he had girlfriends and his nieces and nephews would be around at the same time and they've given interviews since they said we were there with it wasn't just those boys it's ridiculous that we were there with him and also some of the staff are there there's over 150 staff in neverland so yeah there you go it's, it's just one of those sad stories because the guy was so lovely incredible man talented ah just good mm. heart good for the world mm. yeah just misunderstood and he misunderstood how the view the world viewed him although towards the end he kind of got it yeah big plans but um but yeah but yeah it's just the, the, the ways the hollywood the doctors and that pain a lot of pain inside there from reading this nonsense about you all the time and people making these i don't think michael ever recovered from that the thing you could accuse people of, the child molestation, murder, rape. I mean, it, they got him where it hurt. And he's the last thing on his mind. That man was like just incredible. Like, yeah, amazing. And I can speak firsthand. He spent time with my kids, you know, and 
absolutely no issue whatsoever. He ain't the slightest bit interested. He's more interested in his, his, uh, his women. And I, and I knew because I was sneaking him into his room along with my mates. And that was what we did because we thought it was the right thing to do. Uh, he wanted to create his life. He used to say to us, I want my life to be the biggest mystery on earth. Yeah, he used to say, people, um, to be interested in you, you have to be interesting. You've got to stay relevant. And he wanted to put the mask on, the shades, the one white glove, the short trousers, the loafers, the glitzy socks. And when we went, the sh yeah, when we went behind the scenes, it all came off. And he put a pair, a pair of jeans and a T-shirt on, got the whiskey out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all a, all an act to become Michael Jackson. What, what, what was life like for you um, after his death? Yeah, it, it was pretty tough. Oh, it was very tough. I mean, flipping heck, it was just like... I didn't think he was going to die on us. I thought he was going to call the shows off. I didn't think he... Obviously, we were in communication, and it wasn't going well. He wasn't turning up to rehearsals like he should be. I spoke to him on the Tuesday night. He called me, and my wife put the phone on to me, and I spoke to Michael, and he spoke to Madison, my daughter, and Lola, my other daughter, and um, he basically was not sounding right on the phone. He was like, hi. Mm. And I said, are you okay? He said, yeah, the doctor's given me something called ephedrine which is like the next step up from caffeine yeah. a lot of dancers take it and bodybuilders take it and stuff i said the doctor's giving you that i said yeah because i got to perform tonight matt because they say if i don't get it right tonight i got to do all my songs from abc to want you back all the way through the billy jean then they're going to call off the, the whole thing and it's going to ruin me financially so the doctors give me some ephedrine he and i said i need some help i, I need joseph's number and I said, wow if he's asking for joseph's number it's got to be serious I said, why do you want joseph's number for so he's the only one who can sort this shit out. I said, okay. I gave him Joseph's number, just like I did back in the car that time. And he said, Matt, can you come out to Los Angeles? Because I think this is going to get quite nasty over the next few days. I said, Michael, I got, I got like, there's like five children at the time. I had two stepsons and three daughters. I can't just get on a plane. I, I'm seeing you in a few weeks, time at the O2 Arena for the concerts. And she goes, okay, that's fine. I said, can I have Mark Lester's number? I gave him Mark Lester's number. I said, where's all your numbers? Where's all your numbers? So they said, I don't even know where I am. He said, I've got no idea where I am. I've got all my bodyguards have changed and the ones that had in Las Vegas, they've gone. I've got these new ones by the concert promoters. I've got no, I've got no landline that works. And uh, he only basically had my number because I knew somebody who was there at the time who was linked to the nanny. So I gave him Mark's number. I said goodbye to him. He called Mark after, begged Mark again. Again, Mark was a single dad of four kids. He couldn't just drop everything and go to Los Angeles. And then he called his dad, Joseph, and left a message on his answer phone. Unfortunately, he didn't pick it up to us too late. So on a Thursday night, Michael died. And then Joseph picked up the, the answer phone on, on like the Friday, which basically said, you know, Joseph, please come to Los Angeles. I need you. Um, they rehearsed me too hard. I don't know where I am. I'm getting taken advantage of. They're being rude to me. They're being tough on me. And you, I need you to come in because he's strong. Joseph, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, it wasn't what he signed up for. Mm. Like these 50 shows, I only signed up for 10. I don't know where the other 40 came from. And now it's a reality. I don't know how I'm going to do it. And uh, th yeah, they were saying some pretty harsh things to him, he was saying. And uh, yeah, Joseph picked up the answer for message too late. His son was already dead by that point. Yeah. And, and uh, do you remember getting that call? Yeah, on, on the Thursday afternoon, I mean, I came back from work. And um, came in and just like I normally do, I sat with the kids for a few hours and uh, and then Yuri Geller was ringing me like crazy, saying um, he was in London somewhere. He's on his way back to his son and on Thames house in the back of a car. He said, I've got America M media outlets ringing me saying Michael's in a coma. I said, oh, Yuri, he's got shows coming. He's just made up some publicity. He's fine. I spoke to him a couple of nights ago, went to rehearsals and he's okay. He's, he's, he'll be fine. Said, oh, okay, Matt, it's fine. Then about an hour later, Yuri rings me again. He said, I've got Fox News on the other line, CNN. I'm going down my driveway, Matt, and the freaking house line is ringing off the hook. There's got to be some truth to this. They're saying he's had a heart attack. I said, Yuri, he's fine. I'm not going to ring him again because there's been so many times over these years where he's put sticky tape all over his face and created these publicity stunts. So when I rang him, he's like, ha-ha, you fall into my trap. So I'm not going to ring him. I just refuse to ring him. Because I ring him, they, they had a little bit of a fallout. But they were going to meet again in London and sort it out, you know. And um, so I'm going to ring him. Anyway, when I was on the phone to Yuri, I, I come off, literally Mark Lester rings. And when Mark rings, because he's the closest friend, Mark is godfather to all of Michael Jackson's children. And Michael's godfather to all of Mark's children. And Mark's godfather to mine. It's all a, Yuri Geller to it. It's all a bit into it, very close. Mark's ringing me. I knew this This is not good. I asked the phone. He goes, where are you? I asked him at home. So who are you with? So I'm with my wife, my kids. Okay, are you sitting down? Yeah. There's no easy way to tell you this, Matt, but Michael's dead. 
I was like, whoa, what do you mean he's dead? There's nothing on the news, so there won't be, because no one's going to say it because it's, it's such a big announcement, and they're going to get sued. Um, he basically just spoke to the nanny. The nanny was screaming and crying, saying he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. and he's, That's it, he's, he's, it's, it's over, he's, he's dead, there's no coming back. And we didn't have any other news than that, that was it. And then I watched the news that about an hour later it went to, Michael Jackson rushed to the hospital, the ambulance was coming out in a coma. I already knew he was gone. And then his, a couple of his brothers were ringing me saying, are you with my brother? Because I've been walking around a shopping mall and they're saying my brother's not good. And, and then one of his brothers called me and said, uh, hey, Matt, I just, uh, I just come out of a, a shop and I, I heard people say that Michael Jackson's dead. And um, I went up to him and said, excuse me. They, and they didn't recognize this particular Jackson because he has got the kind of fame like, like the others had. He said, can you just tell me what you said? He said, oh, the singer Michael Jackson's passed away. And this is Michael Jackson's brother, right? And, he's, and I said, listen, you need to call your mum. I'm, I'm not with Michael, I'm in England. And um, I didn't have any more information for them anyway other than what Mark told me about what the nanny said. And then, um, yeah, later on, about an hour later, it went coma to, we're sorry to tell you, got news to report the coroner's announced that the singer Michael Jackson died at the age 50. And that was it. And then the next few months was just like absolute wild. You can't defame a dead person. So the tabloids just went for it. Mm -hmm. Michael Jackson this, Michael Jack, wacko, jacko, and... I went crazy. It was just constant. And because I was famed by association, going back to that again, because I was linked to him, they would attack me too. They would mm -hmm. attack Yuri. A bit more careful with Mohammed Ofar because he was the billionaire. They, they don't want to mess with him. But they would go after us and McCauley Culkin and stuff and all these. You couldn't do anything about it because they allegedly or close source to said this. And they could say whatever well, they want about Michael because you could, this, this law, you can't defame a dead person, which should be changed really. And... Um, yeah, it went on. And, and yeah, life was never the same after that, that's for sure. Yeah. Well, <coughs> then I got labelled the bodyguard yeah. from there on in. But uh, that was crazy. I, I didn't sleep for about two or three days. And uh, I tried to fight his corner. I tried to fight his corner because it was so negative publicity coming out about him. I knew why. I knew how he died. I mean, it was quite obvious because I, I could see patterns that were near misses that happened with beforehand. And we got told there was a doctor there. Yeah, I knew, I knew it would be to do with sleeping drugs for sure although I didn't know it would be the general anaesthetic so he was basically taking general anaesthetic to sleep every night the doctor was giving him like, you have an operation with ephedrine to come up and his face yeah. to come down so yeah yeah ephedrine to dance and then and whatever else maybe antidepressants and things were in his blood and bazendapines like valium and things to bring him down and then he still couldn't sleep and then the doctor would give him well if you have an operation put you to sleep knock you out general anaesthetic and it was just too much he just didn't wake up yeah. So, so you've mentioned that you're you're in this space now of trying to help people and, and change lives. How do you do that? Yeah, well well, I didn't realise the value that I had to offer until until the time where we had to stay at home and people were reaching out to me thinking they're gonna lose their businesses. And I've been in business a long time. I've been through the recession in two thousand and eight and we grew through that. I said told all my clients, my franchises, we're not gonna take part in it. We're gonna we're gonna market harder, we're gonna go for it. We tripled our business. So when this situation happened where we had the, you know what, and we had to stay at home and um, and so forth, I'll mention that you can bleep it out, the, the, pan, <laughs> the pandemic, then um, it made the wake-up call to me. People were reaching out to me and saying, listen, you've been in business for all your life. What do I do? I'm going to lose my business. I've got this retail shop or I've got this online business or how can – they were crying on the phone to me, you know, and um, I realized there's this need for, like, mentoring. And then coming out of that – in the, in the lockdown, I spent a lot of time on Clubhouse. And we had these rooms where we were sort of trying to keep ourselves sane, I think. Because the entrepreneurs, we, we could fly wherever we want, do what, whenever we want. This time, we were told to stay at home and we can do what we want. So all the top entrepreneurs were, were networking with each other. And um, coming out of that, I ended up doing the stages and stuff. And my story is so unusual. Because uh, I talk about my dark sides as well as my upsides. And and I, I've got this simple formula. Because I've taught thousands of people to go off and be millionaires. Because through my franchise, because that's what it is. You take a business in a box, I've made all the mistakes, so you don't have to make it. And I mentor people. And I just set up this, um, I just set up this website. It's just, it's just like low level. It's uh, www.mf.club. Uh, it's just a website. And I just put videos on there every week um, on social media marketing, in you know offline marketing, Facebook marketing, how to get in the media, how to build a brand, how to start a scale a business, how to franchise, how to license a business, how to get out your dead-end job, 
how to get promotion at work, how to become more healthier. Then I, I tap up my contacts, like entrepreneurs or celebrities, and, and get them to do videos too. I do online events. I do an in-person event every three months where I get big name celebrities come along and they do it for free for me. And in return, I for this, I mean, at the moment, they're, they're only paying like £9.99 a month. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I build this massive community now of people who want to change their life. And they just log in. They come to the events for free. It's all included. There's no sales at my events. You're not going to get pitched to or anything like that. No run to the back of the room, get your wallet out. And I just say, as it is, this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do that. Don't be silly. Don't go and do that. And, you know, spend some time with your kids. Put your health and your family first. And that's normal. That's called a challenge. It's not a problem. Mm-hmm. Go and study this on the membership site. Go and do this. And it just took off. It went massive. It went absolutely huge. And it's one of the biggest membership sites in the world now for entrepreneurship and investing. And on the back of that, I've been doing podcasts like you wouldn't believe and stages, taught the big stages and yeah, all the time. Most of them are online now, these big stages where we have thousands of people there and I'm a keynote speaker. And again, they like to use the Michael Jackson hook because they want to know, what did Michael Jackson teach me mm. to build a £120 million pound empire? How, what, what did he know that others didn't know? He studied the greats like James Brown, Fred Astaire, Charlie Chaplin. He had access to the head of Disney, at, you know, Mohammed Al-Fad. What did you learn from Mohammed Al-Fad? What can you bring to the table? And what I teach is so different to the others. And I think they... We, like social proof there's so many people out there now faking who they are um, with their Instagram and their Facebook profiles or if you actually look behind what they've done they haven't done anything at all whereas me there's no hiding it it's all in Google the good, the bad, the ugly <laughs> it, the social proof is there for over almost three decades now of being an entrepreneur I don't know life any different mm-hmm. so they know I'm the real deal if you go on Rich House Poor House it's Ofsted regulated so you have to give them access to your accountant you've got to disclose your how many properties you got, how much you earn, your accounts and so forth. And yeah, that blew up. I love, I love doing it. I call it my passion project. That's why I only charge like a minimum fee, like 10 or a month, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's fun. It's, like if you go to, to go to the gym as a hobby or do martial arts, so for me, that's my identity. That's my life. Mm-hmm. This is what I get to do. This is what, yeah. So I've got a big event on this Friday. I've got Nigel Farage as a keynote speaker. Love him, I hate him. He knows his stuff about the government, what's going on, the tax system, and how to build your own economy, not rely, rely, rely on, on someone else's plans for you. And I've got Caprice, a supermodel, multimillionaire. She's coming down. I've got Michelle Heaton, pop star from Liberty X, TV star. She, she knows how to get celebrities to endorse your business. And I've got multimillionaires, mind power experts. I've got Yuri Geller speaking at the event. And they all get that for nine ninety nine a month. And for me, it makes you feel good. That's basically all it comes down to. So they turn up at 9 o'clock in the morning until 7.30 at night and they come away, just like I did back in the day. All this information, they've not been pitched or sold to. Everyone's told they can't sell anything. And um, so that's what I do. I, 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 I love to do that. That keeps me sane yeah, in my incredible. mad world. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's incredible considering, you know, the journey that you're, you're on now and that you just want to help people. I love it. You know, it's, uh, yeah, it must be quite... Especially on the mental health side. I mean, people, you wouldn't believe only men reach out to me and like mm. DM me on Instagram and... And if people want to DM on Instagram, they will get me. They won't get a VA or something. I do, I do replies for everybody. And, uh, but yeah, but I um, I get bombarded with people who are struggling. Ever since that, you know what, it's, it's, things have changed. And I mean, the interest rates the highest we've ever been in 15 years. We're, we're formally now we've been announced in recession. We've been in recession for a while, the truth be known. Cost of living is the highest ever been. So people need proper advice like this. Before the pandemic, People don't want to talk about money in England. In America, you can talk about it mm. and stuff. In China, the UK, you just, oh, don't talk about that. Now we put events on about making money and people flock to the damn things and online. So people realize now you do need money to pay your bills. Rents have tripled. Mortgages have tripled, quadrupled. They might go up even more yet. Interest rates have been the highest been in 15 years. And still, I don't think, see there's any slowdown on that. Inflation has got office, office rocks. Things are expensive. Going shopping now is like a mortgage payment. So... I want to teach people how they can, you can't save you out of this. Like you've got the money saving expert over here, Martin Lewis, haven't you, in the UK, who's done well to help people get past. But you can't save yourself out of a recession or depression. You have to earn your way out of it. And you need to have multiple streams of income. And that's what I teach people to do, how to break out of this. You shouldn't be doing a nine to five job you don't want to do. You put on this this earth to thrive, you thrive not just survive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. You got it. And uh, yeah, so that's my mission. Do you know I've really thoroughly enjoyed our ch- our chat today, Matt? Me too. <laughs> I could I could easily let this go on for a, a balance. Uh, That's a, right. A lot longer, but 
yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I really you, appreciate you coming down today. It was an absolute pleasure meeting you. You're welcome. And um, I look forward to your um, your future and uh, what it looks like. Brilliant. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Cheers, Matt. Thank you very much.